Hi, my name is Josh, and today we're going to be talking about advanced cardiac hemodynamics for management in the CCU. So I know some people are having PTSD seeing some of these engineering equations on the board, but they can be very helpful for evaluating and managing patients. Let's take a look. This is Ohm's law, uh, where V represents the potential difference across a conductor, and that's equal to the current flow through that times the resistance. We have the hemodynamic analog, which is the pressure gradient across a flow circuit equals the cardiac output times the resistance through that circuit. Now, we can think of the body as one large circuit of blood flow, but actually breaking it down into two smaller circuits can be very helpful. The first of those is the pulmonary circulation, which connects blood from the right heart to the left heart. And then the systemic circulation connects the blood from the left heart back around the body to the right heart. So let's write out this equation uh, for each of these two circuits. First, from a pulmonary standpoint, the front pressure, again, we're thinking about the pressure gradient, the front pressure on the right side of the heart is the mean pulmonary artery pressure. This is subtracted from the back pressure on the left side of the heart, which is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And this equals the cardiac output times, in this case, the pulmonary vascular resistance. On the systemic side of things, the front pressure on the left side of the heart is the mean arterial pressure minus the back pressure on the right side of the heart is the right atrial pressure. And this equals the cardiac output times, in this case, the systemic vascular resistance. So a couple things to note about these equations. First, the cardiac output term in these two equations is exactly the same. As we said, this is all part of one larger circuit, and flow around that circuit has to be conserved. Second, you can notice that a lot of the terms that we see here are terms that are commonly brought up on CCU rounds and ones that we have access to. Uh, and that is to say that we can use these terms to optimize some of the variables in this equation. So let's go ahead and start doing that. What do we want to optimize in these patients? Uh, you know, because they're end-stage heart failure patients, ideally what we're trying to maximize is the cardiac output. So let's solve for cardiac output in these two equations and we can start optimizing for it. That will be do done by dividing across the resistance term. If we do that, on the pulmonary side, we have cardiac output equals mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge over pulmonary vascular resistance. And on this side, cardiac output will be the mean arterial pressure minus the right atrial pressure. And this will be divided by the systemic vascular resistance. So a couple general things to note about these equations. First of all, if we're trying to maximize cardiac output, there's essentially two ways that we can do it. One is by minimizing the denominator, making it as small as possible. And the other is by maximizing the numerator, making it as large as possible. The way that we'll maximize the numerator is by maximizing the delta, or the difference between these two terms, i.e. making this term as small as possible and this term as large as possible. So let's go ahead and start doing that. On the systemic side of things, in order to make the SVR as small as possible, we can reduce the afterload. And afterload reducers are medications that we commonly use in the CCU, and there's, there's a number of them. In terms of looking at the numerator, when we want to make the right atrial pressure as small as possible, this is the clinical correlate of the CVP. And both re reducing the CVP and the right atrial pressure is done by reducing the preload to the right heart, uh, and this is done via diuretics. So this is where our diuretics come into play. Maximizing the MAP is a little bit more complicated. As you might remember, the, the MAP term is made up of a combination of systolic and diastolic blood pressures, which means that it, has, uh, it is affected by both cardiac pump function and vascular tone. In terms of optimizing, i.e. maximizing the pump function, there's basically two classes of medications that we use. One is inodilators, and these are medications such as dobutamine and milrinone. And the other is more traditional pressors, the most common of which that we use is levofed. Both of these will augment the inotropic function. The difference is that the inodilators, as it says in their name, will also dilate, i.e. reducing the systemic vascular resistance. And we can see that further optimizes our cardiac output. On the other hand, the more traditional pressors will augment the inotropy, but they will also increase the SVR. And this is counterproductive 
uh, in terms of optimizing the cardiac output. And for this reason, we typically choose inodilators over pressors for inotropic support. When we look over here on the pulmonary side of things, if we start in the denominator, we want to make this term as small as possible. A high PVR is another way of saying that the person has pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in order to reduce this, we have a number of medications, and they're pulmonary vasodilators. This might be inhaled nitrous. Uh, it might be a, a pulmonary vasodilator such as sildenafil. Uh, and that will help to reduce this term. In terms of optimizing the numerator here, this is a little bit more difficult. So we can, we can minimize the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and this is typically done via diuretic strategies. The problem is that the, the front and the back pressure on the pulmonary circulation are much more closely tied than the pressures here on the systemic circulation. And most of the maneuvers that will decrease the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will also decrease the pulmonary artery pressure, which means that we can decrease the wedge, but usually we'll concurrently decrease the pulmonary artery pressure, not changing the delta between these two terms at all, and thus not optimizing cardiac output any further. But if we look through these equations, we can basically see in red um, the areas that we have for therapeutic management. That's pulmonary vasodilation, afterload reduction, diuresis, and inotropy, ideally via inodilators, but sometimes via pressors. And this really represents the, the entire portfolio of therapeutic options we have in the CCU. One other interesting thing to look at while we're here uh, is what happens to these patients when they become septic with uh, distributive shock. So typically in distributive shock, we're trying to optimize the mean arterial pressure. We can use this same equation to solve for this term. Let's do that by moving across the right atrial pressure. That equation then becomes mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance plus right atrial pressure. So in terms of maximizing the map, maximizing the map we have three ways to do it. Increase the cardiac output, increase the SVR, or increase the right atrial pressure. We've already seen that these patients have a very difficult time augmenting the cardiac output on their own. And management-wise, we can increase the SVR or increase the right atrial pressure via pressors or fluid resuscitation, respectively. The problem is, as we've just seen, these are two terms we're trying to minimize when we're trying to optimize the patient's cardiac output. So increasing these two terms will actually decrease this term and be somewhat counterproductive for the map. These patients have very difficult to manage starling curves, and this is why when they become sick with distributive shock in the setting of their underlying cardiac disease, they typically need management in a CCU. Thanks for watching.